Hello everybody and welcome to Starlog Articles. Starlog Articles. Okay, so in this video, we're taking an article straight out of Starlog magazine, issue number one, number one. This one caught my eye because it features William Shatner. And this particular Starlog issue too, it was like highlighting Star Trek and the two leads, Shatner and Nimoy. So here we have an article about and with William Shatner. And it's titled Shakespeare to the Stars. Wow. That's what Shatner is in uh, the mid 70s. I believe this is uh, 1974. It's 1976. No, 1976. Zero hour. And it's those twilight years of Shatner's career where he was, you know, obviously looking for work and getting work, but, uh, you know, obviously very known as Kirk. Here he is being featured, William Shatner. Shakespeare to the stars. That's, that's what I think of when I think of, of, of William Shatner. This article is by Kirsten Russell. And here we go. Let's, uh, let's, let's dig into it here. While Star Trek is science fiction, said Gene Roddenberry when the series was launched, our stories are basically about people. This is not a series where you invent a machine and then fit a story around it. Our stories will always involve believable people in believable conflict, but without a space as a backdrop. The stress on human... Okay, well, let's just stop there because could not the writers and the producers of modern Star Trek take exactly that quote from Gene Roddenberry, digest it fully and create Star Trek that is again about people. Our stories are basically about people. That's exactly right. And that's that's how you relate to it. Our stories are basically about people. This is not a series where you invent a machine and then fit a story around it. That's exactly what the writers of, of current modern Star Trek do, both Discovery and Picard. They, they invent this silly the silly machine and then try to build a story around it and they can't quite decide how the, the parts of the machine fit together. It's just a mess. So anyway, let's get back to it. The stress on human drama in Star Trek necessarily necessarily led to a stress on characterization, especially on the characterization of the commander of the spaceship Enterprise, Captain James T. Kirk. While Kirk is a science fiction hero, he is no stock figure. He is an he is an intelligent, sensitive, strong-willed, fallible human being shouldering the responsibility for a risk-filled operation involving a crew of over 400 members. Well, yes, that's true. I mean, at the time of this writing, there were no other Star Treks. This was the only Star Trek. And, yeah, of course, that's all the qualities that we all know of Kirk in the original series. Not surprisingly, a Shakespearean actor was chosen to play him. Okay, this article is clearly emphasizing that Shatner is, is, should be known as a Shakespearean actor. I mean, he, he is and was, but I mean, I wouldn't mark him as a Shakespearean actor per se, but I'm sure he, anyway. Had it been offered to him with a, a few years earlier, William Shatner might have refused the starring role in Star Trek. He was bent on a career as a classical actor, and he wasn't apt to tie himself down to a TV series. Fair enough, fair enough. And he, in those you know, early shows like Twilight Zone, um, uh, and, uh, any, anything you find early in his career, he's, he's very good. He's very, even on Trek, of course, Star Trek, he's fantastic in that first season. Those first ten episodes, amazing. And he wasn't apt to tie himself down to a TV series, yet he had always had a certain affinity for space adventure. One of his boyhood heroes had been Buck Rogers, whom the young Shatner had often pretended to be while playing on rooftops. At times, he had gone so far as to leap off a roof into space, landing in a snowdrift. <laughs> All right, let's just check out this. Uh, this sh photo of Shatner, man, is wild. Is it not peak 70s Shatner? I mean, check it out. Check it out. Motorcycle, archery, off the bike. Like, it, like it's almost like he's been riding on the motorcycle, shirt off, 
archery gear on his back and, and he spotted something. He spotted something. He's gonna, and, and he stopped the bike and he's pulled it over and he's pulled out his archery gear. And he's like, you know, so it's, it's alpha masculine, you know, like it's just so masculine. It's just so Shatner. Even then, peak Shatner. It's like, to me, it's like an album cover. Motorcycling and archery. <laughs> Of course, are just two of Shatner's many activities outside of show business. Other sports activities include skiing, swimming, scuba diving, skydiving. Oh my god. Right on target! Right on the dime! Actually, Captain, your precise target was 35 meters that way. I mean, is there, what's the limit? I mean, uh, car racing, tennis, boxing, fencing, and karate. There's nothing left off that list. I'm gonna do a tri elliptical jump. That's where you jump out over northern China. Do three complete orbits and then start to re empty. He insisted on doing his own fight scenes on Star Trek. Oh man, that photo, man. I mean, if you we were ever gonna get an autograph photo of Shatner, that's the one, right? All right, Canadian born. Shatner attended McGill University in Montreal. So I thought we have not even had a quote from Shatner in this article, but let's keep going. Canadian-born Shatner, maybe because I'm talking too much. Canadian-born Shatner attended McGill University, McGill University in, Mon I wonder if that's still there, Montreal, majoring in business administration, hmm. but, becoming, but becoming so active in campus theatrical groups that by the time he graduated with a BA in 1952, there was a little doubt as to his choice of a career. His voice was already known as the Can on the Canadian airwaves in his absorption with his professional goal. He had done numerous radio shows, but his standards were high and exacting, and he chose the most difficult route to becoming a professional actor. He first went to work with the National Repertory Theatre of Ottawa, gaining plenty of experience and earning roughly 31 Canadian dollars a week. He didn't, he doesn't remember those days fondly. They were hell. I got through them only because I had a dream in front of me. I hoped to become as fine an actor as a Laurence Olivier. Eventually, Shatner joined the Stratford, Ontario Shakespeare Festival as an understudy. His big break came when he was pressed into the lead of Henry V one night and went on cold without rehearsal. Understudied uh, Henry V and with no rehearsal. Without one word of rehearsal, I went on one night. <laughs> it was fantastic, he recalls. After the show, the audience and the cast cheered. And I pulled it off. In Tamburlaine, the 300-year-old Christopher Marlowe classic, Shatner was given the role of the second male lead. The play was so well received... But the company took it to Broadway, where it lasted through only 21 performances, and Shatner nevertheless received rave reviews. He also received numerous job offers, including an offer for a seven-year contract. Well, I've got a film contract out of it. For a seven-year contract with 20th Century Fox at a salary of $500 a week. He turned it down? Having come up the hard way, Shatner was still wasn't inclined to start taking it easy. No, he's, he's tough, our Shatner. In fact, his rise in the Stratford Shakespeare Festival had hardened the standards he had set for himself in the beginning. It had steeped him in Shakespeare, as well as in the experience of working with some of the best actors he would ever work with anywhere, such as Alec Guinness, James Mason, and Anthony Quayle. I still had the idealistic dream of being an Olivier-type star, he says. I didn't want to be a Hollywood actor. Having said no to Hollywood, Shatner turned to Toronto to star in a TV play which he had written. <laughs> During rehearsal, he met a young Canadian actress, Gloria Rand, and they were married a few months later. They spent their honeymoon in Scotland, where Shatner played a featured role in the Edinburgh Festival production of Henry V. Television beckoned, and Shatner returned to New York to appear in serious dramas on Goodyear Playhouse, Philco Playhouse, Studio One, Circle Theatre, and Omnibus. On the other hand, he refused starring roles in such series as Dr. Kildare and The Defenders. A co-starring role in a two-part production of The Defenders was all he wanted of a series for the time being, particularly since that role led to his movie debut in the distinguished 1958 production of the brothers Karamazov. 
Karamazov. After playing the saintly brother in Dostoevsky's classic, Shatner accepted a non-exclusive contract with MGM. Nothing, nothing, nothing happened. happened. Uh, eventually, he bought out of the contract so that he could take the starring role of Robert Lomax in the Broadway... Man, he loves the stage. In the Broadway production of The World of Susie Wong, the play enjoyed a two-year run, but Shatner didn't enjoy doing it. Unfortunately, the play that emerged after rehearsals soured. At this point, Shatner decided it was time for him to grow up. Time enough after, I achieved financial security to go back to the classics and be an artist, he says. I returned to Hollywood after Susie and worked in many films and television series, always trying to have integrity about the roles I chose, but even that went by the boards after a while. In order to survive, I had to work in anything that would pay me. Once I made that decision, I stuck to it. To everyone's surprise, I turned down starring roles in Romeo and Juliet and King John and Stratford, just to remain in Hollywood and keep my name in front of the hierarchy. When I say I decided it was time to grow up, he explains, I mean I recognize the fact that great parts come rarely to an actor. Most of the time it's slugging away in run-of-the-mill endeavors. You do the best you can with all your resources. You work to make a living and to support your family. In Shatner's case, he eventually had not only his wife, but three children to support. Shatner didn't entirely leave the stage after Susie Wong. He also appeared in the Broadway productions of A Shot in the Dark and the hit comedy La Idiote. Not the idiot? But he showed up more and more in films. He acclaimed Judgment at Nuremberg. The underrated The Explosive Generation and the controversial The Intruder. As his talents were not limited to acting, he also wrote a teleplay and sold it to four star productions for Tony Randall. It was a starring role in a small screen series launched in 1966, however, which unexpectedly made Shatner the world famous. I could have done equally well financially had I decided not to do a TV series in favour of guest shots and movies, he said at the outset of the venture. But I believe in the dramatic possibilities and the potential of the show. We have the opportunity to do something truly worthwhile. Science fiction can be an art form. Ray Bradbury has proven this. The series, of course, was Star Trek. Shatner came to feel particularly close to his roles, Kirk. You might say that Kirk, in many instances, comes closest to myself of all the roles I've played, he once commented. This is so almost of necessity when you work day after day in a TV series. It's a two-edged sword. I utilize aspects I know about myself in portraying Kirk, and sometimes I discover things about myself through him. Star Trek watchers will undoubtedly agree that it wasn't merely the TV series format which brought Shatner into such communion with the character he portrayed. Has any of his roles since Star Trek the plum roll of PBS's The Anderson Trial, or the guest shots in series like Ironside, The Name of the Game, Columbo, and even his starring role on Barbary Coast being quite as attractive, as sympathetic, as dimensional, as human, as the role of Captain James T. Kirk? And could any stock hero, any pretty boy personality have given to the role, what it was given by William Shatner. There we go. So let's just have a little quick look at some of these photos and their captions. Pre-Star Trek attempts at Shatner starring TV series included a $750,000 pilot for Alexander the Great, which was never bought, for, uh, uh, bought, and for the people, which was up against Bonanza and survived on the air for only 13 weeks. Well, that's pretty... For long. In 1968, Shatner appeared opposite Francie Noyan in the Broadway play The World of Susie Wong. The production was financially successful, but he was so dissatisfied with it that he eventually decided to abandon the theatre for a while 
and to pursue his career in Hollywood. France Noyan, France France Noyan teamed with Shatner once again in the episode titled Elaine of Troyes. In the title role, Noyan played a spoiled princess who needed some lessons in common courtesy. <laughs> Her teacher turned out to be Captain Kirk. Ooh. Yeah, I, I'm gonna go back and rewatch that episode. I wasn't I wasn't aware that's who he was on stage with in that play. That's that's fascinating. This publicity still shows First Officer Spock attempting to establish tele telepathic communication with Kirk through the dangerous Vulcan technique called the Mind Meld. Yeah, that is a beautiful photo. I don't think I've ever seen that uh, very often. That one. Hey, there you go, Kirk. There. Shatner's role as Captain Kirk seemed to bring him home to his original creative goal. I feel at the height of my powers at this moment, like a like a finely tuned racing machine. He said during Star Trek's run. I've even given up smoking to keep myself in the best of shape. We all need some personal purpose, some goal, even if it's just learning to paint by numbers, says Shatner. I've tried to find challenges in my own life. My work is a daily challenge. I challenge myself with new skills. The big challenge is to become a success as an actor. And certainly, William Shatner most definitely achieved that. So, what a terrific look at that not too early, but early to mid era of, of William Shatner's career that Starlog issue number one captures. I don't think it's a direct interview. I think it's a bit of a a sort of a synthesis of interviews, but uh, nonetheless, a nicely put together article uh, of Shatner of this particular era, 1976. So anyway, that's it for today now, guys. I hope you enjoyed that article from Starlog magazine number one. This is Justin Hoffman, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.